I've already mentioned that uh, you don't have to be rich to be a foodie. Being a foodie doesn't have to be expensive. So I want to talk a little bit about some of your cheap eating options when you're traveling around Europe. Uh, and the most basic uh, cheap eats you can get in Europe are street food. And if you're on a budget, just become a connoisseur of street food. That's a great way to get through Europe and have some really truly local dishes um, at a very low price. For example, if you're in the Netherlands, you can have herring. If you're in Germany, you can try a whole world of sausages. Now, when we think about German sausages, we just think there's bratwurst and then there's bratwurst. Um, <laughs> But for Germans, they know there is a whole world of different regional varieties of sausages. So if you go to Nuremberg in Germany, you'll see that it's these little skinny, spicy sausages that they serve lined up three to a bun. That's a very typical Nuremberger sausage. If you go to Berlin, you'll see that they slather their bratwurst with a delicious sort of curry ketchup sauce. It's called currywurst. Um, so again, become an aficionado of the local specialties where you go, even if it's just street food. If you want to go to the Netherlands or Belgium, you're going to want to try some French fries, or as they call them, Flemish fries. Uh, not only do the fries taste a little different, they brag that they actually fry them twice, so they have a little bit more bite to them. Uh, but if you go to a little uh, Belgian fry shop, they have a whole interesting variety of sauces that you can put on top. Um, so you can ask for some help from the clerk and find a really nice sauce that goes well with your fries. Uh, when I'm in Great Britain, my favorite thing to grab on the go when I'm at a train station and I just need a lunch on the train is a Cornish pasty. Um, these are this beautiful savory pastry from Cornwall, which is at the southwestern tip of England. This was actually invented for tin miners in Cornwall. This is where you can start thinking about the history of these foods that you see everywhere. Uh, why would this be for the tin miners? Well, they worked all day down in the, in, the, in the dark mines of Cornwall, and their hands would be filthy with soot and tin deposits that would be really dangerous if they were to eat them. And that's why a pasty has a really thick outer crust. And this allowed the miners to grab onto the crust and to eat the filling on the inside. And when they were finished, they could just drop their crust into the mine shaft for the Tommyknockers, the little mystical beings who live down in the mine shafts to eat. <laughs> um, I love learning about the histories of these little foods. And at every train station in England, it seems like, you're going to find a, a place to grab a Cornish pasty before you get on the train. If you really want to find a world of really interesting uh, street food options, Look for like a street food market. A lot of, uh, especially big cities that have a, a foodie scene, you're going to find a place where a lot of interesting vendors all set up shop. This is my favorite market in London. It's called the Rope Walks Market. It's buried under a railroad trestle uh, on the south bank of the River Thames. And I went here once with my wife. I think it's probably the best lunch I've ever had in London. We just wandered from stall to stall. You could have a little bit of Scottish salmon. And then there was a stand that was serving up grilled cheese with English cheddar cheese, of course. Uh, all different variety of scotch eggs with interesting creative fillings, brownies. These are all kind of foods that you'll see everywhere in Britain, but it was fun to go to a street food market uh, where they were being done in a very elevated, very foodie forward kind of way. And in fact, a lot of uh, cities in Europe are increasingly have a food truck culture like we have in a lot of American cities. Uh, and of course, this can change from year to year. It's a parking lot one year, and it's got five or six really interesting food trucks the next year. So be sure to ask around if you're going to some of these cities. Are there any food trucks? Where can I go check out the local scene? Another good way to eat affordably is to eat what you might call ethnic food or international food or immigrant food. Uh, for example, a donor kebab is, is what this is. And all over Europe, from Spain to France to Germany to Italy to Norway, uh, this is what local people go if they want to just grab kind of a quick, nourishing, flavorful meal on the go, um, and very cheap. It's sort of like going to a taco truck if you're in the United States. What's interesting about uh, immigrant food or, or international food is that, uh, like the United States, a lot of countries sort of have a large immigrant population that have really influenced their cuisine. In the United States, if we want to break from American food, we might go for a Mexican restaurant. Uh, in Britain, there's a lot of Indian restaurants because India and Bangladesh were former uh, colonies overseas from the United Kingdom. Um, and so you find that there's a lot of great Indian food in Britain. Uh, this applies to a lot of countries in uh, Germany. People eat Turkish food. That's kind of their immigrant cuisine. And even in Russia, which has a very kind of uh, old-fashioned, uh, kind of a starchy, less flavorful cuisine, when people want to break from their traditional cuisine, they go to a Georgian restaurant. This is from one of the former soci socialist republics of the Soviet Union in the Caucasus, where they have warmer climates. They have uh, more flavorful ingredients. They have lots of herbs. Uh, so when a Russian is ready for a break from their traditional food, they'll go to a Georgian restaurant, and they'll get these dumplings uh, that you dip in a delicious plum sauce. They have a dish called khachpuri, which is sort of a cheesy fry bread uh, that you can get. I really think uh, Georgian food is the great undiscovered cuisine 
Mark my words, it's like, it's like poke, for example. <laughs> Five years from now, there's going to be Georgian food everywhere in the United States. It's really delicious. Um, so always look for these kind of, if you want to break from the, the local traditional cuisine, be sure to look at the local immigrant cuisine as well. Another good uh, tip for budget eating is to check out Europe's market halls. There's lots of great traditional market halls, like the Great Market Hall here in Budapest. Uh, some of them are very famous. In Spain, uh, in Barcelona, they've got the Boqueria, which is right on the Rambles, the main drag of Barcelona. There's an interesting trend recently in Europe where old market halls are being renovated and upgraded and being given a more contemporary foodie focus. For example, there's the Mathallen in Oslo, which was a traditional old brick building that's now been turned into basically a food court of top-end foodie restaurants with beautiful outdoor seating. And this is a trend I've seen all over Europe. In London, they have the Borough Market, where you can go and get delicious fresh breads and cheeses. In Florence, their central market hall, they recently kept the uh, traditional fruit and produce and meat and fish vendors downstairs, but the upstairs attic, which was always abandoned, they've converted into a top-end Tuscan food showcase. And they've invited top-end Tuscan chefs to come and open food stands here. Uh, one of my favorites is in Lisbon, the La Ribera Market, uh, which again, half of it is still a very traditional old-school food hall of Portuguese classics. The other half has been uh, converted into a contemporary food court with some really uh, top-end chefs. By the way, this is a great opportunity sometimes to try affordably the food of really big-name chefs. So here in Lisbon, if you went to the restaurants of some of the chefs who have little food stands here, you'd be paying a pretty penny. But they intentionally designed a menu that's more affordable and more accessible for the food hall. So make sure you check out if there are any of these contemporary food halls in your travels. In some cultures, uh, the market is part of their local culture. It's part of their everyday life. All over France, communities have a designated market day, Jour du Marché, where all of the different vendors come and they set up shop right in the city center. My favorite market day in France is in Sarlat, in the Dordogne region. And every Saturday and Wednesday, they close down the town center and it's just filled with all sorts of vendors <coughs> serving all sorts of things. This is where people stock up on sausages and big wheels of mountain cheese uh, and bushels of spices and olives. And this is also a social ritual. This isn't just about shopping for food. Uh, this is about connecting with your neighbors. It's about connecting with your friends. It's about forming a relationship over the years with the producer that you know is your favorite producer for buying this or that. And one of my favorite aspects of the French uh, market day culture, once it's all finished and they're closing up shop, the second that all the stalls start to close up, all of the outdoor cafes just fill up. All the people who came out to shop go and grab a table with the people that they want to reconnect with, their long lost friend that they haven't seen in a few months to settle in and, and catch up on the day's events. Uh, it's a really beautiful part of the culture in France. If you're going to France, make sure you find out when the market day is. Uh, another way to forage for really good food is just to stop into lots of little specialty shops, especially if you want a little higher end food. You can go to a cheese shop, you can go to a uh, cold cut shop, a salumeria in Italy. You can supplement that with what you buy at the grocery, and now we are picnicking. Um, by the way, let me define the word picnicking. You might think that a picnic is a very romantic situation with a wicker basket and a red and, and white checkered tablecloth. Uh, but actually, for me, a picnic is just any kind of practical, functional meal that I can eat on the go that I shop for in a grocery store. A quick lunch on a train that I bought at the supermarket in the train station before I get on a long train trip, that's a great picnic. Uh, that said, if you're really a foodie and you really want to make a memorable picnic, it is worth seeking out um, a nice uh, romantic spot, memorable st spot, and a really nice scenic uh, opportunity to have a great picnic. And sometimes these are actually designated. You'll look for signs in France, for example, and they'll say a great picnic spot is over this way.